a scholarship. We have a, a hermeneutic of historical grammatical method. We have a historical... We use a methodology that most scholars will use. I hope in my lecture to use the methods that historians use in assessing a hypothesis for historical data. This means my method tries to keep within the mainstream of historical scholarship. Also, it is very important to note, as we use the historian's tools, it means we are using historical data as evidence, not presuming or defending an inspired Bible. This is important because one or two skeptics have tried to strawman me here. They've tried to suggest that my belief in the Bible is the word of God is influencing my in my understanding of the historical data. But I have been upfront and honest that I have presuppositions. But also the skeptic has to be honest that they have presuppositions. Discussion, even though my presupposition may be the inspired Bible, my argument does not rest on an inspired Bible but upon historical method that secular historians use. So therefore this argument against me would be a straw man. Number one, the historical method that historians would generally use is number one, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of the facts that our hypothesis accounts. The hypothesis that has the most relevant facts has the best explanatory scope. Second, explanatory power. This looks at quality of the given facts. If you can explain your position with a less ambiguity, then it has better explanatory power. If one has a strong presence, you may get some due to the nature of patchiness of history. The hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge better than any other position. We look at opposing views and see also if they conform, confirm, by anything in history or today by sciences. Fourth, ha less ad hoc. We use less non-evidence assumptions. We are in a better position than using such arguments that lack like any evidence. And five, illumination. A hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems, and if this is the position, it strengthens one case. One's case page 109 to 111, The Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona, A New Historical Approach, IVP 2010. Uh, in the paper, uh, a roundtable discussion with Mike Lacona on the resurrection of Jesus. He says, when conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presuppose that the source with which we are working are ignorant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported in those sources is true and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have that luxury. Theology and history are different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now, I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reason of a different sort. My object in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty apart from any faith commitment. My approach is a little bit nuanced than Lycona. I recognize actually in ancient historiography and in present historiography there is always theological reflection. The historian has ever written in history without putting their interpretation. Interpretation is theological reflection. It is a theological, it is not historical. So you cannot have history without information and facts and interpretation. It is not possible. So I would disagree a little bit with my friend Mike Lacona not, not my friend personally, but a, a man who I greatly respect. What I would say is that we all, whether skeptic or not, all are influenced by our biases, but that we can look at historical facts 
and come to some objective understanding. But we have to recognize that our presuppositions will be there and influence our interpretation. You can never completely get away from presuppositions. You can never completely get to the facts without being influenced by presuppositions. But at the same time, we can look at reality of the facts. They are there, facts are facts. But there is a tension, there is an interplay between facts and presuppositions. So my position is much more nuanced and much more subtle than Mike Lacona's. But we have a criteria that the secular historians use, and we use that in our historical di discussion. The next, we build on the facts that we already know. Dr. E.P. Sanders has noted has noted a number of facts. facts that the scholarly world generally agree with. Now what the atheists do not tell you, what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-Christianity, they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection like Dr. Carrier, Earl Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders set, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean who preached and did healings. Number three, Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Number four, Jesus did his work for Israel. Number five, Jesus was controversial at the temple. Six, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death. Jesus followers as a movement and finally a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the new movement Galatians chapter 1 13 22 Philippians 3 6 the persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career 2 Corinthians 11 24 Galatians 5 11 6 12 Matthew 23 34 E.P. Sanders 1985 Jesus and Judea Judaism uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press and just a little aside notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community virtually no atheist on the internet or even the atheist scholars will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them so we've looked at presuppositions we've looked at methodology now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra, and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't beat, beat me in debate on this. I had a, a debate with DPR Jones. I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus. I had a discussion with Thunderfoot. But none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship, my arguments, and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly, academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently, John McDropout challenge, uh, took on the challenge for a debate, and I would actually love to debate him. And I've said I would debate him, and given him... Uh, I said to him that I would debate him but when you have idiots ride into the city center and try to film your atheist when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations 
and all that kind of stuff going on and people like John Met Dropout um, commentating on archive channels that are in the China uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves from that kind of culture but basically the atheist community, the skeptical community has not in any shape or form in any way dealt with the issues that I've just mentioned before we even get onto the evidence they have not dealt with presuppositions they have not dealt with methodology in any shape or form the best that they can do is quote Earl Doughty or a Richard Carrier or a Price but there has been no in-depth debate and discussion on the issues that I brought forward but there was a tacit running away from the skeptic and an endorsement of drama and cyberbullying against me and the scholarship that I had to bring on this subject was completely ignored when people realized that hey, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about and if we continue to discuss with him we're going to be educating people and we don't want them to be educated in the kind of scholarship that this guy is going to bring and so I was excluded from the conversation So, so we'll look at some of the evidence for the resurrection. Um, first of all, the four Gospels can be early first century and can be shown to be of eyewitness material. I could go on and on and on of the litany of information here. Uh, if you want to get a general outline, um, you can look at Wallace's paper on uh, tracing the eyewitness accounts, the Gospels, back to the first century as a very popular look at. But you can find that the four Gospels can be traced back to the early first century and traced back as eyewitness material. From a historical point of view, that's pretty amazing. You, you don't normally get that kind of quality information on a topic. Um, I, I could go on and on and on, uh, but we'll just mention 120 AD, Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, in his letter on the Gospels and other New Testament books. Basically, it's over 19,000 times the early church fathers quote from the Gospels. You can look at the Didache teaching text used widely by the church. The writer quotes from Matthew on the Lord's Prayer. That puts them, the Gospel to 95 AD. Uh, Matthew's quoted in 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. They are written when the life witnesses were around. Scholars that believe that the Gospels are from an early date are John W. Wainham, Professor of New Testament Greek, Berg Gerdesen, Swedish scholar, Professor at Lund University, Ma 